You need structure in sales. You need to plan properly. You need to research. You need to have selling skills. And whenever I use the word selling skills, people think of opening, closing, handling objections, asking questions. But really, if you think about selling, it's, it's a little bit more expanded than that. It starts with planning from the very beginning and it ends with when you're recording and you're reviewing your call or whatever your actions are. So there's a lot of structure there. Why did I become an executive coach? I saw lots of great people fail to get ahead at work while their much less talented peers blew right past them. That made me furious, but also curious. What were great people getting wrong? It came down to helping them re-examine what drove success and then helping them make critical shifts one hard truth at a time. Feel like you're doing everything you were told, but you're not moving ahead at work nor having the impact you seek? Then welcome to 97% Effective with Michael Winderoth, where we skip feel-good, happy talk and engage experts in pointed conversations about what it really takes to move the needle at work and your career. So if you feel stalled or frustrated or seek that extra edge as you move to the next level, then look no further. This is the hard truths playbook you never got. Hi, I'm Michael Wenderoth, and you're listening to 97% Effective. I don't get no respect. Famous words by Rodney Dangerfield, the late American comedian, and words that every salesperson has said. Because, well, it's true. And I'm sure as you listened, and as soon as you heard the word sales, your mind raced to someone slimy, hawking their product to put a commission in their pocket. But the hard truth is that top salespeople have strong interpersonal skills, reading people, the ability to influence, skills that research shows most propels us up the leadership ladder. Point blank, salespeople understand persuasion and influence. Today, I'm honored to be joined by sales and selling expert Zia Muhammadjani. Zia is the president and founder of the Madison Company and Sales Institute Japan. Based in San Francisco and Tokyo, Madison focuses on improving Salesforce effectiveness through field-based training and coaching. In a world full of bells and whistles, Zia brings a back-to-basics approach grounded in the fundamentals, and that has dramatically improved the effectiveness of tens of thousands of sales professionals over the past 30 years. I've invited Zia to share what makes a great sales rep so we can discuss practical insights into how those same skills and habits can also accelerate our careers inside companies. Zia was born and raised in Japan. Prior to founding Madison, He held senior sales and marketing roles at Johnson & Johnson in Asia and the United States. Zia, welcome to 97% Effective. Hey, Michael. Nice to see you again. Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure. To start, your last name is not Japanese. What is the backstory of you in Japan, and how has that upbringing shaped how you think about sales and selling? Well, as far as the backstory, uh, if you have another two hours, I can, uh, you know, I can fill you in on it, but I'll give you the short version. My parents were, uh, I guess, stateless uh, refugees uh, living in Japan during, uh, you know, during the war, uh, World War II, and, uh, you know, they lived there, and they survived the war, and after that, you know, a few years later, I came along. I grew up in Japan, in Kobe, and in the mid-60s, uh, we moved to San Francisco, to the United States, uh, you know. My parents were big on education, so, uh, you know, education for the kids. And I grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. I uh, got my graduate degree in, uh, you know, marketing, uh, and I'm going to be a great marketing guy. And first job I got was sales. Oh, my God, I'm going to be a salesman. What am I going to do type of a thing, you know, that mentality. But, uh, you know, growing up in the Bay Area, the thing that I really, really, I think, took away from that more than anything else coming to the States when I was around 11, adapting, working hard, have a dream. Uh, those are the things that, uh, and then, you know, stick to the basics, really work hard. And those are the things I think uh, that a lot of immigrant uh, kids, uh, you know, pick up. And I think, uh, you know, I was no exception to that. Well, that mentality has propelled Madison and your career. But I want to take you back, right? You had mentioned 
growing up in the States and then your first job in sales. And I recall when we first met, you, you mentioned your early career in corporate. Mm -hmm. You talked a lot about navigating the corporate jungle back then. Mm -hmm. From your 30 years since then training the best at sales and selling in complex environments, I think this very much speaks to our theme today. Yeah. If you could go back and coach 20, kind of early 30s Zia when he's navigating the corporate jungle, what would you advi have advised him? First thing I would tell myself is toot your own horn. I was always a little bit passive. Uh, I was naive into the corporate world. You know, I came from, as I said, a background that uh, didn't have any, uh, you know, people in corporate life. So I, I had to navigate my own way. And I thought that was the way. Keep your head down, work hard, et cetera, et cetera. But in the corporate uh, jungle, if you want to call it, uh, you kind of have to, you know, say, hey, I'm, I'm here. I'm good. Listen to me. I know what I'm doing. And my biggest uh, supporter was my wife. Yeah, you, you met Sophia. You know her. Yeah. And uh, she always used to say, she says, why are you always trying to be something that you're not? She used to lecture me all the time. And I said, ah, you don't know anything about business. But she's a wise, wise woman. And she said, uh, you know, be yourself and, uh, you know, go out there um, because they hired you for a reason. And I moved over to Japan. And, uh, you know, after a few years, I realized that, you know, there are very, very few people like myself, fluent in Japanese, understands the culture, have a sales background, can understand marketing, can communicate in both languages fluently. And those are the type of things that I never used to. I took it for granted. And that was a problem. Don't take yourself for granted. Uh, make sure that, uh, you know, you stand out. Make sure you fight for your beliefs. Uh, and, uh, as, of course, and you work hard and you do that. Uh, you know, you don't do a you know, a smoke and mirror show, but at the same time, make sure that you are recognized and that you're in front of people. Let's talk about sales and selling. And yes, I want yes, to take yes, us... yes, 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 let's <laughs> talk about that. I love it. It's fantastic. It's great. And, and I want to take us back to over a, almost, I was looking up, trying to look up in the calendar, almost a decade ago, that could have been a little bit more that we first yeah. met. Yeah. I had gotten this notice that there was going to be a speech at the U.S. Embassy, the commercial section yeah. in Shanghai at the time. Yeah, that's right. And I was actually having a challenge with the business I was running, right? And so, oh, yeah. you know, what are you getting wrong? So it was a very attractive <laughs> title. I was like, okay, short visit. I'll go there. And, and that was you presenting uh, some of your insights from the, the sales work you had done globally, mm -hmm. uh, effectiveness of, of organizations. And, and one of the things that, that, impressed me. And eventually, you know, I hired you. Yeah, you <laughs> we did. Worked yeah, together. You did. Thank you very I, I eventually much. <laughs> later on worked for you. Uh -huh. Was what impressed me was that while you talked about what good salespeople need to do, your talk really emphasized that what's even more important and missing in most places and organizations are sales managers, yeah. sales leaders who do the infield coaching co-riding. Yeah. And this is exactly the, the area that Madison puts a lot of effort in and makes a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. Can you, as we start off here, I mean, we're going to talk about selling, but can you talk about why managers and, and coaching is, is so critical? Yeah. I mean, Madison and Sales Institute Japan, we're, we're a sales training company and we're a Salesforce effectiveness company. We consult, we do all of that. But really, our focus is on sales managers. If you really think about it, we can do a, a one-day program. We can do a, a five-day program. And anybody can do that. But there's no takeaway. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a takeaway of you know, the, the day that you're, uh, you're in the classroom or now remote. Unless you coach, unless you follow up, unless you reinforce, people are not going to go back to old habits. And Sales managers, they have uh, first-line sales managers that I'm talking about. They have the world's toughest job because they're caught between corporate headquarters. They're caught between their senior managers. Uh, the sales reps are always talking to them about it. They got the first contact with uh, you know, the, the, the customers. So at the end of the day, it's the sales managers that are really the critical cog, if you want to call it, in the organization. And if they can coach salespeople, uh, instead of selling themselves, because they're usually super salespeople, um, they might get, get you know the organization is much better. And and I know that you're a stickler on the, you know research and numbers and things like that. 
And every time uh, you, know, you, you look into any type of Harvard Business Review or uh, if you want to look at Aberdeen Group or CSO, whenever a company devotes time and develops managers, first-line managers as coaches and they conduct coaching, sales automatically go up. It's a fact. Even, even for us, we've done, we've done work in the last 30 years and we've evaluated it. And it goes up anywhere from, uh, you know, you do coaching in field, uh, which is, uh, you know, not done as often. And we try to emphasize the importance of field coaching. Um, you know, it goes up anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. Um, and just with the same people, with the same, uh, you know, material, same products. So coaching by first line sales managers absolutely hits the bottom line or the top line. And then, of course, then you get profitable. But uh, unfortunately, too many companies just focus on, you know, let's do training, a two-day program. Okay, check off the box. HR is happy with it. And, uh, you know, we've done training for this year. Supposedly, Einstein said, hey, uh, you know, uh, you do the same thing over and over and over again and, uh, you know, expect different results. That's the definition of insanity. But unfortunately, that's what corporate, uh, corporate does. Uh, they do the same type of training. They do the same things over and over and over again. And they don't really emphasize what's really critical. And that's the coaching part. And sales managers having this multiplying effect mm -hmm. from what they do, particularly when you invest in them and help them coach yeah. you know, their, their, their sales force. But I thought it was interesting kind of as we were prepping before this uh -huh. and we had a conversation, you had gone out to some of the top sales leaders, you'd recently talked to them. And you also made this comment because we tend to think of coaches sometimes as very supportive and encouraging, but you, you, you made this comment that there, a bunch of them are not exactly feel good, nice people. <laughs> they really were kind of demanding and 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 driving excellence. Can, can you speak a little to that yeah. because it does challenge a little bit of this what I sometimes refer to as kumbaya yeah, thinking. Yeah, the kumbaya all thing. Friendly pals. Oh, I tell you, this kumbaya thing is uh, you know that that's the that's the worst thing you can have. Really, is uh, everybody's equal? You know, I I truly believe that. Uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, when we talked, uh, maybe I came across a little bit too strong. You don't have to be an ogre, all right? You don't have to be mean. But you have to be disciplined, structured, demanding, fair, and also uh, have the ability to teach and coach and take the time for it. Too many managers will say, yeah, I can uh, teach, I can do this. But they always uh, have another meeting that uh, you know, they're running to and they cancel the field session with the sales, uh, sales rep, things like that. But I do believe that sales managers, um, they don't have to be everybody's friends. We're here to do a job, get it done. And if that, uh, talk, if that requires, uh, you know, uh, communicating with a person in uh, no uncertain terms, so be it. But there's, uh, you know, salespeople, uh, they all uh, um, communicate differently. Some people like to be told directly, some people a little bit more softer. So that's the, you know, the, the role of a manager to understand how to communicate. But um, I truly believe that, uh, you know, you have to have uh, strict uh, discipline. I'll give you an example. We all use CRM somewhere in our careers as salespeople, all right? But when I go into calls uh, or into, uh, uh, cust uh, customers and I say, hey, what's your uh, CRM usage? And what type of benefit are you getting out of the, you know, the CRM that you've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars or yen or whatever it is, euros to it? And the answer that I get from senior management is, yeah, well, we use it. Uh, we get some information, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there really isn't what you call um, a discipline in using the CRM to the level that the corporation really requires. Managers don't see. The ones that are really, really successful using a CRM or any type of a tool or anything that, that's in place is when sales managers follow up. This is what you're supposed to do, and this is what you're going to do. And I will follow up to make sure that, uh, you know, you're on the right track and then we're having a communication based on this. So it's just, uh, you know, going back and forth, but uh, doing what's expected and making sure that, uh, you know, the salespeople follow up and, uh, you know, that you're there as a sales manager, first line sales manager to uh, help them and guide them through. I like what you said about the discipline there, because the other adjectives or notions that come to people's mind when you hear about sales reps is that they they just wing it, right? They're talkers, and you know they're, <laughs> That's what they're I do. acting in the in the in the moment, right? Well, <laughs> let's go into very come kind of some of this practical stuff. And I, I know you joke a lot that you wing it, yeah. 
okay? But I have worked with you. I have seen you in action. And frankly, you winging it is total BS. Um, <laughs> you prep, you practice, you get feedback, you follow a system. Mm -hmm. That's what's made Madison very effective in, in you know, your own selling, your own training, et cetera. And I want to ask this kind of larger question. Is selling more of a science than an art then? Can you comment on that? Yeah, I get asked that a lot as far as uh, whether, uh, you know, selling is an art or a science. Um, early, uh, you know, I used to hear a lot about salespeople. If you can talk, uh, you're a great salesman. But I've been with talkers that can't close. I've been with quiet people who are very, very good. But I've come to the conclusion that, uh, you know, it takes both, of course. And uh, the art part of it is maybe about 20 to 30%. But the science part of it is, you know, the rest, uh, you know, the 60, 70, whatever, 80 percent. And that being said, the art part of it is really kind of reading the room, uh, if you want to call it that. And, uh, you know, just uh, trying, to, trying to get a feel for something that's going on. And those are the things that, uh, you know, it becomes, uh, you know, innate after a while. And that's the art part of it. Building relationships. That's the art, really. But the science part of it is just as important and it's maybe even more important because you need structure in sales. You need to plan properly. You need to research. You need to have selling skills. And whenever I use the word selling skills, people think of opening, closing, handling objections, asking questions. But really, if you think about selling, it's, it's a little bit more expanded than that. It starts with planning from the very beginning. And it ends with when you're recording and you're reviewing your call or whatever your actions are. So there's a lot of structure there. And now it's getting better and better because, uh, you know, when you talk about structure, because with digitization, uh, you know, it's becoming, uh, you know, easier and a little bit more structured. And, uh, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, the Madison Company, one of the things we really, really do is put structure in organizations. And by putting in structure, and I know you love structure and, you know, you're just as obsessed as I am as far as preparing and getting things done. Those are the things that, uh, you know, make a good salesperson. Yeah. And, and you've, you've probably answered my next question here. I mean, at the, at the very intro, I said sales reps are really the masters of understanding persuasion and influence. And mm -hmm. you've talked about some of these other skills, habits, or maybe even qualities. Um, but when you really look. Yeah. At, and again, we are talking here about studying what the top do, not the average or, or mm -hmm. the, you know, certainly down in the organization. Yeah. When you really look at top reps and, and mm -hmm. those who are doing B2B complex environments who have to have a long-term relationship, not just I'll yep. sell it and walk away and never have to deal yes. with you again. Is there, is there anything that you've identified and say, hey, this is the top skills that, that, that the really top ones have compared to the second tier? Yeah, you know, it's funny when you compare the really, really top salespeople. I, I call that the 20% or even the 10%. And, uh, you know, there's a 20-60-20 rule. 20% 20 of salespeople are, uh, you know, you leave them alone and, uh, you know, they'll, uh, they'll achieve their numbers. 60%, you got to support. 20%, even if you have the cheapest product, uh, the best product, uh, the competition's out of stock, um, you know, they're not going to be able to sell or make forecasts. But the, the, the cream of the cream, the, you know, the, the, the top 20% and even the 10% that, what do they do differently? Well, I believe that they research, they plan, they do the background work that a lot of salespeople don't do. The regular salespeople will just come up, they'll show up to the company or they go to a customer and they'll, as you're using your word, they'll try to wing it. But the good guys, the really, really good salespeople, they plan. They have very, very good selling skills and they have good communication skills. They talk very, very fluently. They're very comfortable in the way they talk. Uh, they interject when the customer is talking only when it's necessary. They follow the, you know, the 30, 70 rule, 70% listening and 30% talking so that, the, you know, you understand the customer needs. They do these things in a very, very casual way that it makes it look like they're not doing anything. But like for myself, I, mean, I observe these things and you really, really look into what they do, the superior salespeople, the, the cream of the cream, the top. Um, what they really do is they plan, they extensively plan. They have excellent selling skills. They also do one thing that, um, you know, a couple of other things. One is they review their calls, they review their activities. They don't just leave it be. And last but not least, this is, this is kind of curious and it's so basic that you kind of don't think about it. 
they write, they take notes. A lot of people take notes uh, or else uh, in our research, in our, you know, ad hoc research, if you want to call it over the last 30 years, we find that maybe about, uh, you know, 50 to 60% of salespeople take good notes during calls. And we accompany them in calls, in uh, customer situations. So we get to see them, you know, directly over thousands and thousands of calls that we've done. But the good salespeople take very good notes. You've been listening to 97% Effective with your host, executive coach, Michael Winderoff. If this interview is making you think, make sure to share it with a friend. Now, back to our interview. You've trained, you know, across the world. So it's very interesting to hear your conclusions on that around planning. I mean, these things that you've said, planning and practicing, writing down, reflecting, all things that we can learn, right? That are Absolutely. not necessarily innate. I, I would imagine too, because I, I know a whole, most of your business here is business to business mm-hmm. selling, key mm-hmm. account management. And so you are selling into a very complex yeah. structure, right? Where one person may not be deciding everything, mm-hmm. a lot of influence, even internal conflict. And, you know, the cost of definitely sending a, a sales rep out there is, you know, can when you layer in travel and stuff, you're talking thousand dollars a day. So someone who's not planning and thinking is Wasting. is spending. You're spending a lot Absolutely. of money on that. Absolutely, and uh, you know that that's the thing that uh, you know when uh, when you send a person out there, uh, you really have to make sure that they're uh, you know able to uh, plan properly and execute properly. And this is interesting because here's the crossover where lots of people, you know, in their own careers need to think about who's promoting them, how they get things done in large organizations, which goes to this planning. And I mean, I credit you with a lot of the tools I use helping executives kind of look at their own environments. Mm -hmm. When you're working with key account managers and reps, do you have a kind of process that you kind of put them through mapping yeah. out organizations and what's most useful there yeah you know i think absolutely when uh, you know when you and i worked uh, we talked about this quite a bit and uh, worked together it's really the time that salespeople use in analyzing the business analyzing the organization what's worked what hasn't worked before and i call that you know back office stuff it's not the face-to-face stuff you know, in training, it's funny. It's the same thing in sales because when I'm training, I'm selling something. I'm selling something to my audience, which is the, the trainees. I'm selling them a way of doing things. But the time that I spent in front of them in the classroom or now remotely, it doesn't compare to the amount of time that I spend behind the scenes preparing for it, understanding the business, getting the material ready. And it's the same thing for salespeople, especially in key account management. The more you know about the stakeholders, not only their business desires or their needs, but also their personal needs, uh, the more you know about the company, the competition, what's happened so far, and which way your company is going and how you can fit into that, uh, you know, that uh, equation. Those are the type of things that uh, you know, I think key account managers, uh, you know, uh, salespeople that go into key account need to do more of. Because they think that, you know, going into a complex sale is the same as going into a transactional sales. A transactional sales is a one-off. Uh, complex sales is something that you want to develop over time. You also want to have a relationship and you want to really go for a partnership. And those are the keys that you really need to, you know, think about when you're talking about key account management. And the key account management program that we have, uh, you know, we call it PARTNER. But it's a great uh, acronym for it. And I mean, it works every time. It's a combination of doing the analysis, the background analysis, and also the selling skills that's required to, you know, put that into execution. So this big piece around background or what you called kind of back office, the time you're not in front of the customer Mm -hmm. talking. And you alluded to and and talked before, too, around, you know, good reps Mm -hmm. listen they investigate, and the more they know about the needs of their customer, the better. I'm quite curious here, you know, because you've done this for many years, you've, obviously, there's a lot of technology out there now, too, but do you have, or have you seen, you know, some very effective techniques of how, how can they kind of quickly know? Are there good questions or good things they should be looking for in their customers? 
when they're doing that research or when they're interacting? Yeah, let me, uh, let me just give you a very simple answer to that. You always want to keep a record of all the questions you ask so you don't have to recreate the wheel. You're going to go to different customers all the time, but most of them are the same questions or the same information that you want to get. So have a list of questions ready. You know, go for it. I mean, uh, you, know, you don't have to rethink it over and over and over again. So the way that I always look at it is whenever I go to a new customer, the first thing, you know, I, I, when I'm preparing, I have five or six questions. Okay, why are you doing this? What's the compelling event? <laughs> why, why are you calling me? What's the reason for it? If you don't do this, what's the impact on it? What's your time frame? Do you have a budget? Who's the decision maker? Those are five or six questions that you should ask the first call. You shouldn't be selling your products the very, very first call. So when you're going out there and getting information, you know, gathering information, you're in the information gathering mode. And, uh, you know, you should have a list of questions. I always say to, uh, you know, whenever uh, I'm doing the training and, you know, they want to find out a little bit about, uh, you know, how to penetrate their new accounts. I say the first two times you talk to a customer, uh, don't sell. Ask questions. Ask questions. Of course, you have to give a little bit about your company and this and that. But, uh, you know, ask questions. Make sure that you're trying to find out. Mm. So, Zia, as you rattled off those questions, you almost made it seem like it was innate, like they were kind of coming off the top of your head. But it sounds like there's 30 years of wisdom, programmed, planned, what works, reviewing. These are the strong set of questions you want to kind of hear up front. Is that fair or do you just wing that? <laughs> I prepared. <laughs> you wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, no, I winged it. But uh, if I need to go back to it, I can always go and take a look at it. I don't go anywhere without preparing. I just don't like to do that. I think it's wrong. I think it's a, a, a front to a, a customer. Uh, it's, uh, you know, wasting their time. It's also, uh, you know, taking, uh, you know, uh, money away from the, the company that's paying you uh, by not being fully prepared. I don't want to have to go back the second time and what I could have done just the first time, just because I didn't prepare for an extra five minutes. But, uh, you know, again, as you said, it's true. 30 years, you do get to be a little bit more glib, a little bit more fluent in the way that you do things. So, uh, yeah, it does come out naturally. But, uh, you know, if you're starting out, write down, write down all these questions. And, uh, you know, the other thing is for handling objections. That's one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, traumas that salespeople have is when they get hit with an objection. How do I handle that? And in the training programs, I always say, hey, write down the objections and then uh, take one step back and see what you're going to think about doing. Uh, you know, the first thing is, uh, you know, ask uh, what this uh, objection is, clarify it, and then add, take action. But write it down. Keep a list of all of them. When I'm working with executives, I hear the same thing of, you know, I'm not comfortable asking or I feel awkward if I'm trying to build a relationship and I may compliment someone mm -hmm. or, you know, if that helps mm -hmm. put them in a good mood or this point around, oh, mm -hmm. what if the objections come? You know, so you get a lot of resistance to trying things. And what in your experience helps people most get over that if they feel like there's a specific piece they just can't do? What I find now, and I advise people if that happens, is take that first step. It's jumping off a cliff. It's uncomfortable. And life isn't comfortable. I've learned that uh, the older I get, the wiser I get, as everybody knows. And it's not clean, it's messy, but you got to take that leap. You just have to take that leap and ask the questions, uh, ask for references, uh, you know, introduce me. Just the other day, I was talking to a, I was coaching a guy in Japan, and his biggest issue for 2023 is finding new accounts. And uh, I told him, I said, uh, I said, um, you know, have you talked and asked for references from previous clients? He says, no, I haven't. I said, why don't you? He said, do you think they could help me on that? I says, well, you don't know until you try. Give it a shot. What do you got to lose? All he can say is no. We, we've been talking here a lot about how this can be learned, structure, discipline, back to basics. And you are sitting there in the center of Silicon Valley, right? Which is technology is changing everything. We've now got, you know, chat GPT that's coming out and it's going to replace <laughs> humans on all yeah. sorts of levels. You know, because you've had the long arc here, clearly technology has supported us. 
and, and you have a lot of partnerships now with, with other companies uh, that that bring a kind of digital yeah. um, view or component into what you do. What what has shifted the most in your opinion or that you'd point out that uh, you time. can gain from technology? I really think that it's time and also insight into deals. Before, you know, the, 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 the way I look at technology is it's something that's it's always going to be. The horse and buggy was technology too, probably. The fax machine was a technology, the beeper, all this, uh, you know, now the digital stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But again, the technology piece has become so integral in sales, I believe. However, it's not being utilized properly. It's not being utilized fully. And it goes back to, uh, you know, the discipline of the organization, what the sales managers and even top management sets the expectation. I mean, um, you know, CRM, perfect example. It's such an amazing tool. Salesforce, uh, Microsoft Dynamic, they're, they're great tools. And it's only probably maybe, you know, 15, 20, 30 percent of the, you know, the, the capacity is being used by everybody and then not everybody's using it. But with technology, we get extra time. Uh, we don't have to, you know, um, uh, analyze as much. Uh, the, the algorithms take care of it. I mean, we're, we're partnered with a company called Oculus, and this is a great, um, you know, forecasting and coaching tool. One of the main benefits of this is, uh, you know, you increase sales uh, because you're not chasing bad deals. Uh, from the early stages, you can identify, uh, you know, a bad deal. And salespeople have a tendency of, you know, going after, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get this at the very end. And the last week of the quarter, <gasps> sorry, it didn't work out. But those are the type of things that technology with the AI, the algorithm, all the sexy words that's out there, uh, you know, that does for you. And I'm not the most techie person. I mean, I learned how to use PowerPoint when I was 50. And boy, oh boy, that was tough because, uh, you know, it was it was different way of presenting, different type of uh, training methodology. But now I can't live without it. Uh, last few years uh, with uh, Zoom, with, uh, you know, with Meet, et cetera, et cetera, I've had to learn even at this ripe old age of, uh, you know, late 60s, I have had to do that. But it's, uh, you know, technology is here to stay. It's always going to be. And there's change is always a constant. And you have to, uh, you know, use it. And the more you use it, the more comfortable you get. And at the same time, it's going to make your life easier. The technology for sales managers, I believe, are even more uh, you know, uh, profound than for sales reps. Because sales managers have no time whatsoever. They have to coach. They have to do this. They have to do that. They have to run around. They have to do this. And at the end of the day, if the salespeople don't make their numbers, they got to go out there and sell. But with technology, they can, uh, you know, uh, uh, parcel out some of the activities. Uh, they can follow up uh, asynchronous coaching, things like that. So that's what, from my aspect, from my point of view, you know, as a trainer, as a Salesforce effectiveness manager, first line manager, I have, you know, salespeople working for me. That's what I do. And it works. And if you're not on that bandwagon and says, oh, yeah, I'm just going to do the back of the envelope thing, ain't going to work. Yeah. Have to start moving on. I do want to ask kind of a second to last question before we wrap up here. You know, a lot of your business, a, a huge chunk of it is in Asia, uh, mm -hmm. particularly Japan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in organizations now, we are learning to deal across difference. Yeah. And, you know, you've been doing this for, for, for years. Any kind of nuances as you... You think about selling as it exists in different countries or working with, with different organizations that, that you've pulled out or want to call out over the, from over the years? Yeah, let me expand on that and answer that question from a different angle. Instead of just the cultural differences, I think you also need to understand that you know, there are differences within uh, industries. Uh, there's differences within, uh, let's say, the northern part of a country and the southern part of a country. So, yeah, cultural differences are very, very important. But again, being a nuts and bolts guy, a lot of it has to do with understanding the basics and the fundamentals, which is 80% of everything, whether it's the selling skills. You know, I always like to start out a discussion with a uh, potential client by saying, by the way, um, because they say to me, you know, hey, you're not Japanese, Especially in, you know, in Japan, when I'm going to a client, they say, you're not Japanese. Um, you, know, you speak Japanese fluently, uh, but um, uh, how, uh, how, how much do you know about Japan and selling in Japan? Well, I said, okay, I got my experience for 30 years, but I, let me ask you a question. I said, do salespeople need to know their customers? The answer is yes. Do they need to know products? Answer is yes. 
Do they need to know the competition? The answer is yes. Do they need to have selling skills? Yes. That doesn't change anywhere. Everywhere is the same in that sense. So the basic 80% is there. But then comes that, that magic dust, if you want to call it, that extra 20% which is the cultural, okay, uh, you know, we all know about the, uh, we talk about the Japanese uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it takes a long time to get a, a decision going. And then uh, when it happens, boy, it's, it's good. It happens very quickly and very accurately. Um, you know, you're, you're an expert on China and you know it's just the opposite. Let's get things done first, 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 and then we'll fix it later. You know, those are the type of things that you need to do. Uh, you got to worry about, uh, you know, the branding. Uh, the classic one is, uh, I think, one of the car companies, uh, Chevrolet, going to Latin America and branding a car Nova, which means don't go, it doesn't move. So those are the type of things you need to worry about. And, uh, yeah, you have to be aware of the different cultures and the different industries, the terminologies and the things you do. But, again, don't get so far into it that you forget the basics. I hear a lot of, um, you know, uh, let's say uh, expat managers come over to Japan or even the Japanese coming over to the U.S. And they've read all these things, uh, all these books, they've gone through all the training and they're being ultra, ultra, I don't want to say conservative, but away from what got them there. And I can attest to that because that's exactly what I did. I went to Japan at the ripe old age of 28, and I tried to be Japanese. You know what, Michael? I'm not Japanese. And my, again, I go back to my wise wife. She says, why are you trying to be Japanese? She says, what got you here is your abilities, your ability to speak languages, all the things that you've done, you've improved on, et cetera, et cetera. But that's why you're so successful. I always tell uh, expat managers, wherever they are, believe in yourself understand the culture, don't go overboard on it, but at the same time, um, you know, make sure that the basics are in place. I've seen so many uh, foreigners in Japan who speak not one word of Japanese, become fantastic managers, uh, loved by all, successful from a business standpoint. And I've seen guys who are fluent in Japanese who have destroyed companies. So, again, it really comes down to the person, but the basics are keep it in there and then just try to adapt and work to your strengths. Yeah. So don't lose yourself. And I, I like this because it actually contradicts some of the, you know, the, the popular saying. But a lot of what did get you there, you know, will further get you there and not to forget that. Yeah. Zia, fantastic conversation. I know there's probably one question that I should have asked that I didn't? Anything you want to address or add here at the end? No, you know, I think you said at the very beginning, salespeople are slimy, salespeople are, uh, you know, uh, disrespected, salespeople are... I got to tell you, sales is the best profession that you can get into. And if you really think about it, we sell every day. We sell to everybody every day. But it's such a great profession. It's such an honorable profession that it's, uh, you know, it's a blessing to be called a salesman. That's the way I look at it. Zia, it's been a, a pleasure to know you and collaborate with you in the past. And I'm so glad that you've been here today to share a lot of your insights from Madison Company. Thank you for giving me this platform, this opportunity. You know how I love to pontificate about sales. And I really do appreciate the time that you spent with me. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. So Zia, we will have the show notes. How do people best reach you, reach Madison? Well, you can email me. Definitely, uh, you know, you can look into the website. Madison is www.madisonsfe, Salesforce Effectiveness, sfe.com. Or you can go into, you know, if you want anything to do about Japan, uh, Sales Institute Japan. It's, uh, you know, sijkk.com. So, um, you know, you can call, uh, email me at uh, zia.mohammedjani at madisonsfe.com. Zia, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to 97% Effective, where we skip happy talk and help you break through and ascend one hard truth at a time. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, you can get free resources, including the first chapters of Michael's book, Get Promoted, 
on his website, www.changwinderoth.com. That's www.changwinderoth.com.